and we're, the speech team is also getting ready for the Harvard tournament um, this next weekend where some of our um, speakers are going down to Boston to participate in that. It's one of the, one of the largest tournaments in the country. Um, in sports, uh, speaking of the Swimming Southwesterns, the girls got third um, last Friday and then the boys got second last Saturday and states for girls are this Friday and Saturday and for the boys are on next Monday. In basketball, the boys have a game, I was told it was on Wednesday, um, to decide if they're going to enter the playoffs. And the girls are in the playoffs and their first game is on Monday afternoon. Um, the track team had a strong season, but the size of the team has been a handicap. So um, I don't really know how they're doing. Pat, Pat can probably tell you later. It's, this is a very busy time of year for seniors too. The, service, the Senior Service Project is in its first stages. Um, they finally got a lounge open. It's part of the front part of the old planning center. They found a door for it, which last meeting Pat was telling you about, and so that's open. And from what I've seen, it's getting a lot of use. Um, they're also hard at work on their open campus proposal, and that's about it. Any, qu yeah, any questions? Any questions? I no. just also want to comment, um, not only is the speech team a winner, but I saw in the Courier and also received the notice in my office that Mr. Mullen has been named the Forensics Coach of the Year. So yeah. congratulations all around. We were all very excited about yeah. that, very proud of him. Great. Right. Is that it from the high school tonight? Okay. Oh, I think they're yeah. coming up under communications. Okay. All right. Okay. Middle school representatives? Good evening. Um, we told you that due to sports events, we couldn't have a fifth and sixth grade social. We took the fifth graders to Hot Shots and the sixth graders to Happy Wheels. They both went great, and we might do it again, depending on what most students want. Also in the fifth grade, they just had elections for grade reps, and the winners were Chelsea Marino and Mike Musco. On February um, 17th, which is Friday, we will be having Schooner Fair come up, and we'll um, study the unit on Maine that we are doing for the eighth grade. And after they study with the eighth grade, we'll be having them do a concert for all grades in the middle school. The boys' basketball season is coming to an end while indoor track and swimming are starting up. Also, the seventh and eighth grade just did a dance, and we are not sure of our profits, but overall, we think that we did well. Any questions? That's not. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the next item is communications. Patrick, were you going to make a presentation? Hello, my name is Patrick Cotter and I'm a senior at Capels of High School. Uh, last few months we've been very busy um, trying to pitch our senior open campus to the faculty, um, all related staff, and the school board. Um, we've had mixed uh, yeses and noes from all. Um, mostly uh, people have been generally um, open-minded about it and we thank you for that. I'd also like to give my personal thanks to Ms. Lenoy and the IA department for all these handouts that you have. Um, that was all done on the max down the IA department. Um, I brought Chris Hill with me. He's going to do a little thing on um, what he thinks Open Campus do for him personally. I'll do a little spiel and then I'll make a little bit of a present quick presentation. Good evening. My name is Chris Hill, and I am a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School. Like Pat tonight, I too am here to lobby for open campus at the high school. I have been following this issue closely and have spoken with our principal, Mr. DeFusco, on numerous occasions. I have also spoken with our school board representative, Pat Carter. I am sure you have all re received statistics on the issue, but have you come to the high school to see how the senior class feels about open campus? If the answer to this question is no, then I feel we should postpone the vote until you have done so. However, if the answer is yes, then you have found out a great deal about how the feelings the seniors have about the issue. When I walked through the hallways and asked the students if they were able to name any members of the school board, 
only a few were able to tell me that they knew someone, and they happened to be Mrs. Dransfield and Mr. Greer, and both have students in the high school. When I got these responses, I couldn't help but wonder what the school board was going to base their vote on. You can't base your decision on statistics. Now, how fair is that? And since when has the senior class been reduced to, to statistics? Many of us have made mistakes throughout our three and a half years of high school, and we have learned from our mistakes. Isn't that how we all grow up? This senior class wants to be trusted and respected in this town, and one way for this to happen is to let us prove we can handle open campus. Our class has worked extremely hard through high school, and I am sure I am not alone when I say that I feel we deserve a chance at open campus. We all want to take responsibility for it, give us a chance to prove that we can handle it, even if only on a trial basis. All we're asking for is a chance, and I don't feel that that is too much to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is pretty much how the seniors feel I, if you go around the high school. Um, it's not so much that, the, that they think the school board doesn't appreciate them or um, works for them. They understand that you have people in different grades and that you might not understand all our views and how we act or how we're, we address ourselves at the high school. Um, the main, main reason that we would like open campus is to gain responsibility because for the most part, capable of high school students go to college or they go to work. In college, for the most part, most people, um, if you skip a class, they don't really care. What they're going to do is they're going to send you a bill for six grand and say, see, you aren't coming back next semester. Um, uh, basically, um, as far as the paper you have in front of you, um, the first page is a letter that will go home to the parents the capables of high school seal on it. Uh, the second one is the rules and regulations and a little um, blurb about it. One thing that I'd like to make clear uh, if you look at your little graph or you can look up here um, the first two the first period and the bottom periods have zeros because we already have an existing policy for uh, late arrival early dismissal um, basically, the, the highest number of, ki of uh, young adults in Capitals High School would be 33. That would be out at any one time. I don't think that every single senior would leave the campus. Um, a lot of us use our freeze to study uh, or work um, on extended projects that teachers assign. Um, we get a lot of those in our senior year. Basically, what we're trying to do is get um, get some extra time. We put in, for most part, most of the seniors have all their requirements done by their senior year. And what we end up with with this new rotation that we have that we, that we developed three years ago is two hours, three hours, some kids have three hours a block of time that just, you can only study for so much time during a day. Um, you can only do so much reading. And three hours, two hours, sometimes even an hour is just too much. I mean, you have to you do homework at home, and then you come to school, and you have all this extra time that is really difficult to fill. Are there any questions or things I'd like to comment? Are, are you done? Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any questions at this time. So, I, I, I think we'll probably have some questions and comments, but um, maybe we okay. let you finish. And um, today we had uh, today and yesterday we had a little bit of vote. For teachers, it was 50-50 exactly, with um, five undecided and two sick. So we have not gotten that. Um, just like to mention about the rules on the second page. Uh, basically, the rules are very self-explanatory. They're very straightforward. They're very strict. There's not too many ways to get through them. Uh, the major thing that pops out a lot of seniors, a lot of people, is if a student skips one or more as one or more skips or cuts in the 1994-95 year, he, she will not be, will not have the privilege of open campus for the first 30 days. Um, that's fairly strict. Uh, that way all the kids that have been following the rules get it right off the bat. The kids that haven't have to wait. That's a little punishment because usually there isn't that much of a punishment. 
Um, if a student uh, skips while they're out, signed out on open campus, um, they lose the privilege altogether, period. It's, that's strict enough. Um, basically, uh, this is designed that the students um, are in charge of themselves. They don't, their parents aren't in charge of this. They're in charge of this. Most of us are 17, 18, 19 years old, and they want, you know, I, I understand that the school board wants us to take more responsibility for our actions. This is one way of um, doing that. Any questions? That's about it. I'll start. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I just say one thing? Sure. Um, we're not going to make a decision I wasn't about planning that. this what, tonight. The, the big thing I'd like to, if we could, is maybe get to a uh, policy subcommittee. That way we can get in a smaller, I can bring a few students. We can, that way it's at a smaller setting. We can work out some of the yeah, I think, um, lines. And we, that way we can also talk to the lawyers, insurance company, and let the professionals do their job and not just speculate on right. stuff. So, so we, will, we will send it to the policy subcommittee, but I think tonight, Maybe we could just give you some gen some general feedback, mm -hmm. okay? That can kind of frame where we're going to go from go from here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, first, uh, you you both did a nice job, Chris and Pat, presenting your case. I have a couple questions, and you somewhat addressed with them just now when you said that you were going to speak to insurance companies or to the police. Well, I was thinking about talking to the insurance companies the school has that way. Mm -hmm. That way, um, we have. We know exactly what that our insurance company is going to say, and what they're going to do. And what I, a lot of people, a lot of, especially the faculty, have asked that question. I basically just said, leave it to the professionals. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't. I'm not. I have don't know anything about insurance. I know I get my car insurance bill once a year, and I have to pay it. And that's about as far as I know about insurance. I don't know if anyone on the board is an insurance agent or something. So my personal opinion about that is just leave that to professionals, and let them give that. Let, let them um, give us their input. Right. That, that will be a big piece yep. and the, um, how the police feel about this whole issue. Um, I think, the, I think you, you have a, a real argument. I think there is a problem with scheduling and having three hours in the middle of the day is, is um, hard to understand. I think it's helping us all focus on scheduling for next year and the year after that and, and how the um, high school years are, are looked at and how the classes are taken. And this particular class has a lot of time in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I did look at class um, and the number of students that are taking uh, a pretty rigorous course. And it's not as though the seniors have been um, slipshod. There, there are a number of seniors are taking full loads and still having blocks of time that make it very difficult to fill three hours. And the lounge is not that large. The senior hall can be loud, loud and noisy, and it's not encouraged. And I think you have an argument. Um, and I would like you to bring it to the policy committee and, and that we can investigate it. Okay, on the but blocks of time. I think the time. bigger issue is the scheduling for future years. I yeah. think we shouldn't have this. It's, it's a little late for us for scheduling. For for scheduling. Um, I'll just give you an example um, about my day. Uh, I, have, I carry five classes. Um, I have carried seven at the high school. Uh, I usually am working at least six or seven of those time blocks. Um, I'm not a very good typer, and I'm taking typing, and I'm already, I'm usually about a half a lesson behind, so I'm always trying to catch up. So one of those periods is usually spent in the computer room typing. Um, I'm a terrible math student. <laughs> I'm usually in the math office um, getting extra help. And, that, and that's pretty well. Um, how most of the people, um, most of the students, the senior students work their schedule. Because after three and a half, four years, you get pretty good at scheduling your time so you can get all your work done. And uh, sometimes you get too good and you just have too much time left over. Carla? Um, you've spoken quite a bit about responsibility. Mm -hmm. And there's one aspect that I mentioned when I spoke with you on the phone. And I've been mulling it over, and I'm going to bring it up again tonight. And that is the smoking in the school, which I think is a great example of where a current responsibility is not being met. And I know that that is not just seniors. That goes across all grade levels. But there's a severe smoking problem at the high school. 
in the bathrooms. That's a rule that exists now, and it's a rule that's being constantly broken. And that's just an example of a current responsibility that's just not being met. And at the very least, I'd, you know, I'd kind of like you to address that, but also at the very least, I'd like to see that included on these rules. There are no smoking on the school grounds by I'm, anyone. That's not I'm just aware, a rule I, I'm, for students. I'm completely that's aware of that, faculty, staff. Um, sup, something I, I just thing I just say is smoking is a very addictive habit. Um, I'm an ex-smoker, and uh, it's not an easy thing to quit. Well, and, and it's and it's not. I know I know those are the rules, but uh, you know what? Well, you're talking about going out into the world. Colleges out in the world. The world. There's a lot of addicted adults that work in office buildings that have no smoking policies, and there's a lot of addicted adults that get on airplanes that are no smoking airplanes, and that's part of the real world also. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, even adults sneak in the bathroom and steal a smoke. I worked at a, or about a month, I worked at a, you know, a big building, and they, you know, there were a few adults that snuck in and got I'm not, I'm not saying that's right. I, I personally don't agree with it. Um, you know, that, that's something that, uh, we should maybe look at at a high school level. Uh, that is, a, it is a problem in the high school. I mean, you do walk across some of the bathrooms, and you can just smell it coming right out. Right, and that shouldn't be happening, and it shouldn't exist. And I'd, I'd like you to consider putting that. Any senior that's caught smoking on school grounds loses the privilege. Also, I'd like to see that as one of your rules. Yeah. Anybody, Charlie? I have a couple concerns. One is, uh, you know, the police input into, you know, what they feel will be a, a policing problem with, with people coming and going. The other is the liability to the school of allowing students to leave and, and come back. Um, I was also interested, you didn't give us any stats for early and late, early um, arrivals and late dismissals. Are they about the same percentages? Yes. So we're, we're looking at about anywhere from a quarter to a third of your class yeah, that's already an existing policy that we're. I just know it's an existing policy, but just is that a, That's about right. That's yeah. about right. Okay. It's not uh, this time of year. It's not so much. It's more uh, early dismissal than late arrival. There's, if you look at the sign out, sign in sheet, which this um, policy you're going to have to do. Um, you walk out of the high school on open campus. You have to sign out, and you get back. You have to sign in. That way, um, the administration knows who's in, who's on campus, who's off campus. So if a parent calls and, you know, says, you know, where's Patrick, um, they'll say, well, he's not signed out on open campus. Again, I, I share Mrs. Dransfield's concern about the scheduling impact and, and what this says and the number of, of courses that students have taken, and I voiced that before. But is this something that the principal would like to address? I mean, we haven't. I would like to know what his feed input or feedback. First of all, I'd like to compliment Patrick on his efforts. Um, he spent a lot of time and energy, uh, along with some of his classmates, to, to, to present uh, what I feel is a very plausible approach to this. Um, and I will say that these, these students have inherited a schedule um, uh, two years ago in which an eight period day was put in. Many of them were already sophomores and had full schedules. Um, and uh, they are faced right now with a situation where some of them do have blocks of time uh, when they are free. And uh, I think Patrick is right. There's almost only so much time you'll spend in the library during the course of a school day or, or working uh, on activities. Um, and perhaps it should be, you know, and one of the considerations I had that I told Pat and some of the other seniors that I have a problem with students who may have 55 minutes off during the day that they can't find something to do, but when there's a double block of time, as Patrick mentioned, if someone has two hours of time, I see that as a different situation than necessarily 55 minutes, or having lunch period also surrounded by one or two periods. And I think that would maybe be a consideration that the board would look at also as far as students, and that would change somewhat the, uh, the impact on the number of students who would be free during the course of the day. Um, and, and again, Patrick has worked with me and, and other members, and Mr. Ray, and as far as looking at these numbers, uh, and I think it's been a it's been a good exercise not only for, for him but also for us to see uh, how these numbers let, uh, come out and, and how the uh, students uh, feel about it. And I will say that the, this is a class that uh, I feel is a very responsible group, and 
and I really appreciate the way they've gone about this uh, procedure and have really taken it very seriously and in a mature fashion. So, But we are looking at the schedule in the future, too. I think uh, that's one of the things we're reviewing right now as far as next year and, and years, to, years in the future. So thank you. Um, I want to thank you also, Patrick, for all your information. Um, and I think what you have shown me is the big blocks of time and those problems. And I guess I feel my responsibility as a school board member is not to provide you with more free time. Um, there's been other times, Patrick, you've said that a lot of times you don't know what to do on weekends, kids. We've talked about the partying, that kids are bored. But to actually look at blocks of time and find ways to give you productive, interesting things to fill that time. Um, so I guess as you come to us as the policy subcommittee, um, let us know what kinds of things would be productive ways to fill that time, different than just being released to open campus to go hang out someplace or a different place. But if there are things within the school grounds that we could work with students to use productive use time productively, interesting opportunities, those kind of things, because that's what I feel my responsibility is as a school board member, is not to provide more free time, but to educate kids in lots of different ways. Um, in response to that, i just like to say, I think most of the uh, seniors will find something to do if they get signed out, if they can sign out on this policy. Um, personally, I'll do one or two things. Um, on like today was a D1 day and I had period four and seven off and I was one of the 33 and 29 kids and that's basically um, almost two and a half hours because there's a lunch period in between four and seven and what I would personally do is go to work for those two hours or I might go to the gym and work out at Ocean Fitness um, that'd be something feasible that would save me time at night because um, I usually have to go almost every day just because of my athletics. Anybody else? Okay, um, Patrick, I really enjoyed talking to you the other night. Okay. And I you know, appreciate you taking so much time on a Friday night to go over this issue. And I just want to um, say again a couple things I said to you um, then. And that is, I think, there are I think there are a couple issues here, and Chris also brought it up in terms of saying, you know, we, the seniors don't know us and vice versa, and you brought up the idea of school board members coming in and shadowing um, students at the high school, and I think that's a great idea, and I think we, that's something we ought to talk about so we can, you know, kind of walk in your shoes for a little while. Um, by the same token, it's great to see so many students here tonight um, to see, you know, what we do. Um, and so I would just like to take this opportunity to point out that the school board, um, first and foremost, has to try to make decisions based not on, you know, particular personal circumstances that we're facing at the moment or, you know, as Chris said, look, you know, look at us, look at, you know, the personal situations. We have to look at things from a policy level, whether something is a good idea, you know, in the big picture to do this. I know you feel that your class is particularly worthy of this, but it wouldn't be very good policy on the school board's part, I think, to develop policy year by year for varying circumstances. We, it's, it's our job to kind of step back, look at the big picture, and try to create an educational environment that's safe, um, responsive to community needs, and um, gives you the start you need to do well in college. And I think that's the context we have to look at this issue in. Um, we haven't heard from parents. We don't know what parents are feeling about this. We haven't heard from the wider community. We don't know how the police feel about it. Um, I'd like to hear what the faculty has to say about it. Um, and I think that we need to, to go back and talk about it um, you know, in, the, in the subcommittee level. But I just think it's important for the students to understand that we can't make decisions based on the immediate needs that you see. Yeah, I can understand that. That would be good policy. And the way, one way this policy can actually work is uh, making it, um, first having it approved by the administration um, yearly, so that way some, some classes have discipline problems. They have big discipline problems. Um, some classes don't. And what you can do is you can actually 
make this just so it's a second semester deal. And that way, um, like next year, like my sister's in this, and she'll know that if she cuts a class, she won't get open campus. Now that, that's one way of looking at it. Um, if, you know, that way they get something. Sorry, I thought you were looking around. Okay, no. just a second, Scott. I just, you know, I just reiterate what I said, that we have to look at policy in, in the aggregate. And I don't think that's a decision of, uh, that a principal should be in the position of having to make based on his opinion of the discipline issues in the class. I don't, I don't think that's fair for the principal. I'm not sure it's fair for the class. There's a bigger issue involved here than that. And that's whether the school board thinks that that is a valuable constructive way for kids to spend the six hours a day um, that we are responsible for educating you. That, you know, that's the issue we really have to wrestle with. And there are points to be made on, on both sides. But I think that's a, a decision that we should you know, post, postpone for not, now, not make a decision, go back and talk about it with, all, with everybody who um, is interested in this issue, having a chance for input and um, you know, and then the school board can can talk about how it fits into the greater policy issue. More questions? Okay. Um, Scott, did you want to say something? I just had one question. Um, Pat, are there currently any communities in Maine or New England that offer open air? Uh, there are a few. Um, one that sticks right out is uh, Bath High School. They have a little bit different situation. They leave for lunch um, because they don't have a cafeteria. Um, I, we're gonna, we try to do some research. We found some people that were starting to work on it. We found a couple schools that were at the higher school board level. They were actually gonna get a vote soon. So we're gonna, um, since this is going to the subcommittee, we can actually wait until they make their decisions and we will call them and ask them to send over what their, what their concerns were and what, how they worked it. Okay, great, thanks. Yes? Uh, not, not tonight, okay? This is not an actual hearing on the proposal, okay? Um, this was just, you know, it wasn't even officially on the agenda tonight. Um, you know, so, we've, so we're taking the time to have it presented. I think the appropriate place for it to go right now, there are an awful lot of questions that still need to be answered. And I think they should be done from the subcommittee level. And then you can come back. We'll put it on the, on the school board agenda. And we can have an actual hearing where you can, where you can speak. Well, I OK? Think, I actually just wanted to say one thing. I just wanted to respond to some of the things that have come up tonight. Because by that time, it would be off people's minds. And just some things that people have said that need to get addressed right now from a more personal level. Can you keep it to two minutes? Because you're welcome to come. You're welcome to come to um, the subcommittee level. <laughs> um, just because we've got an awfully long agenda tonight, and like I said, this wasn't, you know, a public hearing tonight. No. Okay. Um, it, hi, my name is Corey Kessler. I'm a senior at Cable Supply High School. I just thank you for giving me the chance to talk. Um, to answer your question, sir, uh, Portland High School does have an open open uh, campus policy. I don't know how that how they go about that, but that's another high school in Maine. Um, I just want to say my day, I I'm a senior. I come to school every day at 7.30 and leave every day at 2 o'clock. And I only have five classes. And some of those classes are extremely rigorous. And I find myself in the high school a lot of the time, the, um, excuse me, in the library a lot of the time. But sometimes I really don't have anything to do. Um, a lot of us are applying to college next year. And I've been along, uh, around uh, long enough to see a successful college process go through with my sister. And I think one of the, the real major thing that makes a successful college process is budgeting time. And uh, this would really give us the chance to see if we have uh, what it takes to budget our time correctly. Because if we don't have that when we get to college, we're really going to bomb out of school. And that's reality. Um, I heard <laughs> someone talking about responsibility um, that we don't, that we're, that we're breaking about smoking. Um, and yeah, that, that's true. I, I'd say roughly 5% of the school breaks that responsibility. But what about the responsibilities of um, maintaining gr grade point average? Uh, just just la or two weeks ago, I was at a meeting when 
Um, it was said, you know, nine, at least 90% of the um, seniors at Cable Elizabeth High ha maintain a grade point average of 85% or better, and I, I consider that to be a responsibility. I consider that to be very successful. And also, what about the responsibility of the whole college or whatever um, plans you have to do after high school process? Because that's a multi-month process, and you know, I myself spend at least six months going through that process, and that's a very big responsibility too. So, I mean, I just don't don't think that we need to be looking at the responsibilities that we're breaking. I think that we need to be looking at the responsibilities that we're maintaining. And some of those responsibilities are a lot, lot greater than just breaking a, um, a smoking policy. And that's basically all I wanted to say. Thanks. By, by the same token, we have responsibilities besides just looking at this situation as well to, to keep in mind. So we need to understand each other. Okay? i just personally like to thank you all for your time. and. Uh, Senior class would like to thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, Chris, Corey, and everybody else who came too. Um, we will continue this process, and I hope you know we can keep listening to each other. Thanks. Other communications? Yes. Let the students clear out. I guess. Um, and as I have already noted, uh, we did have a item where we we're going to look at some of the legislative issues and I won't take the time to go over them but just to list them um, actually in your packet was last week's information about the school funding plan uh, in today's paper there is a better update of that and I didn't even see it myself until later but I would uh, suggest that you take a look at those those plans are preliminary um, none of us know exactly how that will go but I think it's well worth um, our time and attention to try to understand what's coming along. Uh, also, a couple of legislative um, pieces on uh, bills on school choice. I'm sure we're going to hear more about those. I would be interested. Included, um, uh, I'd like to really call attention to the fact that included uh, a summary of the parent conference study that the fifth grade faculty did. They've had a presentation of this both with the middle school faculty and for the middle school parents. Association. Um, I was partially involved in the process, certainly uh, along with other total quality projects that we did last year. I really compliment the fifth grade team for doing this. They not only learned something about how to analyze and go about a, a, a total quality project, but they also have a concrete product. Um, and as you look at that, I just wanted to call attention to the fact that we, they have the germ of or the beginnings here of a model that may sound very simple but it is quite a breakthrough that is sending material out to parents before you actually have the conference um, and in some cases you may have depending on what individual teachers have done you may have had that but for that to become a process would be quite a change uh, would certainly need some uh, piloting, which is what this intends to do, and we will be watching that, getting back to it, and I'd like to invite them to explain that to you um, down the road, that at least get you up to date. And that's it for communications. You want me to move right into um, Yeah, I might as well move, move right, right into the superintendent's report. Okay. And I'm happy to begin this superintendent's report with a presentation. Professor Jim Curry of the um, USM is here, uh, and I have explained, Jim, both in the agenda notes and also in some uh, handouts in the board packet, what the purposes of your course were, and uh, it's actually an ongoing course, as I pointed out. We had a large percentage of our on co staff, on Cove elementary staff take this course, and uh, we now have, um, I think it's 17 middle school teachers taking it. We've begun to have a little bit of conversation about the possibilities for high school. I'd like to ask Jim to start his presentation because really you can see more about this. And we also have, I think, a couple of teachers I notice out there who may have something to add. Mary Bruns is here, who is our kind of in-house facilitator. And um, so, Jim. Thank you. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share ideas. I have had a wonderful time in your elementary school. And uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to have anything with the weight or gravity of the high school's presentation. All I have is fun things to show you. And I'm not going to ask you to make any decisions either. I think you'll find real joy in the presentation. You have an excellent staff at your elementary school and at your middle school. And I had opportunities to work with a number of them in a course. And I'd like to show you the names of the participants. Let's take a 
get this right. Actually, I'll show you two of my favorite participants right here. This shows how hardcore good educators we have. <laughs> and they were very helpful throughout the course. Um, what I'd like to do is to show you a few pictures of kids and teachers and talk a little bit about what kinds of things we did. Start off with, I need to tell you, I promise I won't show all these overheads. I'm looking at people saying, oh my God, it's 400. <laughs> I'll just pick a few. I just got sort of carried away. Uh, this is Ted, and Ted is a kindergarten teacher. I had opportunity to go into his classroom as he talked with kids about presenting different ideas. This happens to be a reporter. This is during Share and Tell during the day. He talked to the kids about different types of questions they might ask or different ways they might help other people. Uh, Ted, uh, along with Marilyn Fegan, has talked to the kids about quality work. How do we know when our work is of good quality? And part of the class then was to set high standards for the kids and to talk about what quality work would be and have them enter into that conversation as well. So this is a poster that was developed by uh, Ariana and by Ted to talk about quality work. So when the kids are doing their drawing, they can check their own work. They can say, is your drawing colorful, detailed, and careful? And this is supposed to be of a child holding an infant. And if you look at the kinds of work done by the children, I think you'd agree that for kindergartners, they have, in fact, been work that is colorful, detailed, and careful. What's really interesting is to hear the kids talk about their own work. It sounds so sophisticated. My work is detailed. It's colorful. I was careful. understand <laughs> <laughs> what we mean about quality work. Marianne, can I ask you about that? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> We set standards, we talk to the children about standards, what things we really expect. For example, this happens to be a display on a phone book with the kids illustrated. This is what we call a product descriptor, and it explains for the students and for the teacher what we expect. At the top, we have a, a description of what the product is. Then we have the parts we're going to have the students develop. And then under attributes, we have qualities of excellence. Now, obviously, we don't hand this out to kindergarten children. But it's for us to then talk to children about their work so they understand what our expectations are. Also in the class, both uh, Marianne's class and Ted's class, they had a choice chart where the kids during academic free time can go over and put their name up to, or these little cards on these different options, and then they can try different things. Ted's class, by the way, did a marvelous job of developing a map of the hallway in which they work, and they talked about what is the compass rows, how we can look at the north, south, east, west. I also asked the teachers to talk to the children about thinking skills. Now, I've never seen anyone actually talk to kindergarten skills about Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy and levels of thinking. But Ted, being the tenacious person that he is, tried to think of a good metaphor that would be useful for kindergarten children. And he's pointing to his poster that he developed. There's a close-up just so you can see it a little bit better. He talked to the kids about how we want to be able to think in many ways about information. We want to know information, understand it in context, be able to use the information, be able to compare one type of information with another, to be able to generate ideas, use creative thinking, and then critical thinking. What Ted did was to walk the kids through a simulation of different kinds of thinking, and then to ask kids to identify the kinds of thinking that they were doing. Okay. Let's skip ahead a little bit. This is someone whom I enjoy quite a bit. She's another kindergarten teacher. She's in the audience. She didn't know I was going to show this picture of her. She talked with her kids about different types of questions. We say that questioning is very important. It helps students to understand the context of information. So this is a chart that Mary Ellen developed. And so when students were doing share and tell, as they were one day when I visited her class, she asked the kids to, after the general report to then ask questions of the presenter. And as the kids asked questions, she asked the students to identify what kind of question is that? A who question? A what? A when? A where? A why? Mary Ellen modeled it, but now the students monitor their own questioning and have asked to generate questions for who, what, when, where, why can do so. And after they've heard the presentation, they then, through writing or through drawing, can give information responding to who, what, when, where, why, and so on. 
I found the kids to be very articulate. I know that there are some pedagogists who says that say that children cannot think at higher levels at this age, but they in fact did. We have to skip quite a bit, I can see, but if you'll excuse me, I'd like to show you sort of the best <laughs> and the brightest. Don't look interesting. Great stuff. Look, we're we're just, enjoying it. Go, go right ahead. <laughs> this is what they like. Right class. She also has a choice board. And here you can see in the background are the reminders that our work needs to be careful, detailed, and colorful. Nice job. It's really a nice job. One of the first great teachers I really enjoyed working with is Sarah Lewis. I think she's a wonderful person. She talked to the kids about a big book called Fire, Fire, Mrs. McGuire. And then she talked to the kids about pages in the book. And then one day when uh, Wayne was in having the students read their pages, I went in and left them too. So here are the students presenting. Sarah set it up a little bit talking about what needs to go into the page of the book and how in fact we might structure them. So each child developed his or her own page, and then they were sequenced together. I'll just show you some examples. All right. Get out of the house, said Mr. Mouse. Mm -hmm. Here comes the fire truck, said Mr. McDuck. The kids were quite pleased with their papers on that point out. That their illustrations were colorful, detailed, and they used the whole page. <laughs> we saved the people, said Mr. Sneeple. <laughs> thank you, thank you, said Mrs. Bankfield. <laughs> and just the credits on the back <clears throat> about the authors. We got our ideas by reading this book. We got our ideas for uh, this book by reading a book called Fire, Fire, said Mrs. McGuire. We were children at first grade at Pond Cove in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. When we wrote this book, we were studying about fire. We authored and illustrated this book. And she, too, developed product descriptors on what we expect in terms of finished work. Now, I'm sure you've seen the excellent work being done by the middle school in terms of rubrics so that we can assess excellence in student work. We find the product is very useful in helping students to check their own work and talk about qualities of excellence. Sarah also, after the kids read, talked to the kids about different ways in which they might show what they know. Sometimes we might do a book, but sometimes we might do a dramatization. That would be a kinesthetic product. Sometimes we might write our own letter. Sometimes we might tell, in terms of share and tell. Sometimes we might do a picture. So as Sarah described the different types of products to which we might share our ideas, she held up a picture of the product and asked the kids, under which category would you place the product type? She turned to the class and said, if you showed by dramatizing, by playing the part, what kind of product would that be? Mary is here as my witness. One little boy turned and said, that would be kinesthetic. <laughs> the children understand there are different ways to show what you know, and they understand the qualities of excellence in a presentation. Let me just skip some of these, actually. Uh, you have very good specialists in your school. You have a good art teacher in Marie. You have a good music teacher in Judy. You have excellent special education teachers. Your librarian is a very fine person. I thoroughly enjoyed her presentation. This happens to be Marie Hayes, and she is doing a presentation on how to have a personalized bag that you might use to give a gift to someone else. And this is the product descriptor she was explaining to first grade. So the students understood the different standards, and then she modeled what she had in mind. Then she talked to the kids about what they might put on the outside of the bag building on an earlier reading and writing lesson on block lettering. Then she showed kids excellent work done by other children of about the same age. She asked the students to come up with a draft of their bag before they actually drew on the bag so she could see that they understood the criteria. And the two of us walked around a little bit and asked kids to tell us why they thought what they were doing met the criteria for really good work. This is Miranda. She was my reading partner. I read to her and she read to me. She was quite good. All right. And the students then displayed their work and talked a little bit about the quality that they had done. And I think for first grade, they in fact did quite a nice job. They then took these home to their parents and either gave the bags themselves as gifts or added other things in the bag. This is Linda Nappy. She's a first grade teacher. She was talking to the kids about stories and about thinking. 
She read for the kids the book, The Little Mouse. They put the title in the middle, and then they added words about the little mouse on the outside, cute, white, gray, pink, and other things from the story. Then they combined the information from the title with the adjectives and descriptive words and wrote their own sentences. They did this as a class first, and then they went to the desk, and they began to write their own stories about the little mouse. Then they illustrated their stories so that people could see the part of the story that they liked the most. And then they presented their stories with illustrations to the class. They were very clear on what they needed to do in terms of their sentence structure, their writing, and their presentation. Here's Linda enjoying some of their work. Okay. So I'll, come, I'll come back and share lots more. <laughs> um, Oh, I don't want to miss that one. Oh, okay. This is Julie Mullins. She's a first grade teacher also. She did a product descriptor on what makes a really good share to tell. Many times kids will simply stand up and say, this is my cat, he is please, and sit down. They're not very clear that you should share at least three interesting points, that you should involve the audience, and so on. So Julie came up with a nice presentation on a good share and tell. That poster hangs right behind the share and tell stage that's in her classroom. I really like the idea of that puppet of that puppet stage. This is a young man, I believe his name might be Dustin, and he's doing a presentation on his harmonica, which he received as a gift. He knows that he has to present important points, how he uses it, and how he might share it with others. He knows he has to do a demonstration that will help others understand its use. He knows then that he is to field questions of class members who might be interested in harmonicas. This is a group of second grade teachers. I went and hung out in their classrooms. They let me play too. <laughs> the second grade teachers came up with a wonderful thinking skills poster on how they might talk to the children about thinking. They used the metaphor of a pumpkin. We can know about pumpkins. We can understand where they come from and how they're used. We can compare one kind of squash with another we can think of imaginative ways to use pumpkins. We can make judgments about pumpkins after we know about them. In a number of classes, I had opportunity to sit down and work with the kids. So this is Julie. And in her particular class, she was having the kids develop a flannel board to show the parts of the story in terms of what they read. This is what it looks like for the teacher. This is what it looks like for the children. So we have it printed large on chart paper, and we have good examples. I went into one class, and this young boy was overlooking his flannel board, and he seemed somewhat amiss. He wasn't sure what he might do. So I sat down to him, next to him, and I said, did you know that you can go through and you can color in the parts that you've already done? He said, no, I didn't know that. I said, well, why don't we do that? And so we colored in parts on character and parts on setting. And I said, you know, it says here that we need to write our name on the paper, cut it out, and place it on the bottom. Can we do that together? He said, I can do that all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, this is a way to help children monitor their own work. And sometimes with special needs students, it's overwhelming if you give them the big assignment. It's much easier if you help them with the first. This is Charlotte. She had kids read Bambi. They then developed a story box to show that they understood the major part of time, setting, character, problem, solution, and opinion. These are second grade students. These are their story boxes. This is the same as what literary critics do, except with big books. They did a very nice job. So you can see that they showed on the different sides setting, character, plot, solution, and so on. Cheryl also wanted the kids to understand the idea of higher level thinking, remember that pumpkin, to compare and contrast. So Charlotte read for the kids two versions of the mitten. And then the students used a Venn diagram, which is a more sophisticated product, to say ways in which they were both the same and ways in which they were different. Then when I walked into the classroom, she informed me that she had told the children that I would be rereading one of the stories with them and we'd be thinking about the story. So I did. I told the kids that we would be comparing once again, talking about ways in which they were similar or different. Then we would be using our imaginations. In the story of the mitten, a little boy uses a, loses a mitten and then it's used as an abode for animals. We imagine other parts of clothing that might have been used by the author. This is a good activity for second grade, but not junior high school. And then we decided which part we liked the most. 
and we went to our desks and we drew a picture of the part we thought was the best and we told why. And as I walked around and I talked to the children, I said, tell me about what you're doing. And they said, we've picked the part that we like the most. We're going to show that part in a picture that's neat, detailed, and colorful, and then we're going to explain why. This is Rindy. She's a second grade teacher. She's chatting. As you can tell, my students were not safe from my camera. And if you walk into her room, she has a warm-up activity every day. It explains to the students what they are to do in terms of language, math, exploratory thinking, and so on. I asked it teachers whenever possible, post students were, along with clear standards. And I walked around and I talked to, to the kids and I asked the second graders to tell me why they were proud of their work, what they had done that they thought was really good and why. And the students were able to tell me why their work was really good. This happens to be a display on paintings that depicts different parts of stories. Here's one on, let's see, oh, the kids telling me why they think their work is really good. Here's a product descriptor on a book jacket that might tell what's inside the book. And here are students sharing with me their book jackets. It was clear that they understood the standards of excellence and were very proud of their work. Let's skip ahead a little bit more. This is Aaron. Aaron could actually get a job at the University of Southern Maine teaching a graduate course. She's very articulate in terms of talking about thinking skills. I asked her to explain to me the idea of creative thinking and critical thinking. She did it extremely well. Anytime she'd like to come to graduate school, she could just come out. <laughs> this is Dottie Anderson's class. And she, too, uses clear descriptors right on assignments for warm-up so the kids know exactly what they are to do. This is a product descriptor she developed with her kids on a paper bag puppet. And this is a display of paper bag puppets in her classroom. The kids displayed their work, talked about their work, really did a great job. Another way they showed what they learned about stories was to write story maps with beginning, middle, and end. And they were extremely well done. This little boy decided he liked the idea of product. He invented his own game. And then he sat with other boys and showed them how the game worked and explained the rules. They did a nice job. I have many other photos. I know that it's about my time, and maybe I'll come back if you have some spare time. I'll just add, one of the people who joined us was Jill Mahler, and she was a parent. And she wrote a very nice article talking about the two teachers at Conco. My favorite part of her article is at the end. She says this, the course represented no new shift in educational philosophy, but presented a way for teachers to do what they already do even better. It was obvious to me that all teachers involved are clearly interested in continually improving their craft. We are fortunate to have such dedicated professionals here in Elizabeth. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, that's terrific. I, I would like to have the board have an opportunity to ask a couple of questions because the, um, I want to also remind people that last year when we changed the placement policy at uh, Pond Cove, uh, one of the issues that was raised was um, what kind of consistency in curriculum would parents be able to expect. And we said that this is part of our discussion of staff development in a variety of ways, giving staff opportunities to meet together, to share um, different ways in which one teacher may have worked out um, curriculum and so forth. And uh, at that time, we had been talking with Jim about uh, doing an in-service course for us because although he said it, I'm not sure you all heard it, um, and I just want to re-emphasize, re this is based on very sound and very important cognitive standards. And the fact that little children are being taught how to explain their own work, how to think about it, and how to talk, I mean, the, the technical term is metacognition, but it is extremely important. And when we talk about the kinds of lifelong learning skills, um, the kind of self-motivated sense of power over your own ability to learn, it is this kind of experience at the early grades that is critical. Um, this kind of approach, and again, you're just getting a, a snapshot, is 
what we would like to uh, have as a kind of, of uh, backbone right up through the grades. I mean, we have seniors who don't know how to do these things, or at least would be they've learned how to do them, but they don't necessarily have a history of conscious instruction against that framework. So that is our vision and our goal, that we would be using these kinds of approaches um, so the teachers can think about curriculum uh, against uh, the taxonomy, among other ways of thinking about issues, and that there's a consistency that can go from grade to grade across subject matter. And uh, I, I just want to emphasize the power of that as a tool so that we can handle both creative diversity but curriculum, uh, a sense of core curriculum. And if, if I see the teachers agree. Um, so thank you very much, Jim. Thank the teachers and so on. But I really basically would like to ask the board if they have any questions. Any questions? We have three teachers who participated. I didn't put them on the spot because I promised I wouldn't. But we have and, and I have more pictures of all of them with transparencies also taken. Susie, I have an extensive number of pictures. So I think I'll get a chance to share this. Your special education teachers, by the way, are extremely helpful. Uh, Susie sat right next to me while I did that lesson in, in Charlotte's classroom and helped me with several of the students uh, almost imperceptibly. It was incredible. So we had inclusion children in there, and she helped me to make sure I was involved in them. Can I, I just want to make one comment? I think that I think this is great, and it seems in the long run it would uh, it will make. Um, I mean, teaching teaching and lesson plans are never going to be easy, but I, I think it it I can see how it would help make sure you're reaching all the kids. Um, but the the other thing I think it's important besides you know the the kids knowing what they're doing, I think it'll make it easier for parents to understand. I mean, it's very clear. I just actually got something at home today with my sixth grader that, you know, was one of those sheets, obviously. I didn't know where it came from, but, you know, just me looking at it, I knew what was expected of him. So I think, I think it'll help everybody just communicate. No one, <laughs> everybody will be on the same wavelength. So I think that would be helpful. I know Lisa Martin, a third grade teacher, has sent home uh, letters to parents with a cluster of product descriptors on kids doing animal reports. And yep. Very clear, very well. Organized. Yeah, I think that'll be very welcome. Good. Thank you. It's okay if I sort of full transparency. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. We're sorry we didn't have more time to go through all of the, the pictures are wonderful. Carly? So you're doing the middle school? Yes. We're, no. We just finished the fourth session, and uh, you have some, some very serious middle school teachers. They're serious about quality work. And, and having the kids do well, I think we're going to get well there. I'm looking forward to maybe an opportunity to present on that. I would, uh, I would, that, would that's, that would be yeah. my next point. You know, it's to make sure that all children get access to critical thinking and, and, what, and expectations and how to, to exhibit their work and explain their work. And, and I would even look forward to the high school yes. going through the same course. <clears throat> Okay. Well, um, that leads me, since we're not going to have a, basically the legislative issues, uh, uh, I'm going to move right down into a, a few quick comments on the new form of the MEAs, and then we have a presentation. I see people here for Project Adventure. Actually, uh, and Jim, I won't put you on the spot on this, but one of the things that the new MEA format being totally open-ended is certainly going to demand of uh, of uh, the state in general and local um, districts in particular, that we are very clear on protocols about how to answer open-ended questions. Uh, it's my sense from what I've seen of the eighth grade and fourth grade tests so far that the, um, the data we get back is really basically going to tell us that we don't have consistent protocols and that will be kind of a starting point rather than an ending point. Um, and we will know more about it later. Uh, in the board packet, I did include some information that I had picked up on the eighth grade, uh, basically focused on the eighth grade MBAs, and then there's some background information um, that was presented at a recent superintendent's meeting to try to explain what the changes are and, and why these changes have been made. I think it's important to realize that the, you know, for 10 years, the public has turned to the Sunday paper and looked at a set of numbers 
Um, we're not exactly sure what the um, numbers are going to look like this year, I mean, where they're going to be changed and where they aren't. But what we do know is that the uh, two things are, are really critical for people, the boards first, and then obviously we need to communicate to parents. Um, we're, the numbers that have been published are really basically um, comparing students in one school district against the whole state of Maine. Um, but, you know, the, how did your student do vis-a-vis -vis all the rest? Um, in trying to change the standards, they're now going to be talking about another level. They're going to use that number, I understand, this year, although I haven't seen them yet, so I'll know more about this when it comes out. But they're going to four proficiency levels, distinguished, advanced, basic, and novice. And the way in which they've set the test up, their expectation is a very small percentage of the students in the state of Maine will become, uh, will actually pop out as distinguished, a slightly larger number at advanced, and that the majority will be in the basic and novice classification. Um, how that stands uh, translates from what we're used to seeing, I don't know yet myself, but I think it's really important for boards, for teachers, and uh, when we get the data communicating it to parents to try to explain what these differences are. The point I'd like to emphasize right now is that when, as Jim is talking in his presentation about um, helping children understand there are standards for work, standards of course can go up or down. This is a community that has had many concerns about raising standards. I don't think that it will be a shock to uh, you people as members of a board or to our staff or to the community in general that when you raise standards, people don't necessarily test the same. Um, so that the uh, introduction of uh, more difficult questions and higher standards is the start of a debate about how we raise standards throughout the state uh, through the task force on learning results and the other things that we've looked at. Uh, but I think you need to be aware that this is going to be a different, uh, little different ballpark. Um, in the uh, information I gave you, uh, and again, I'm trying to be aware that people might be listening to this, uh, the tests that we were giving in the AMEAs were a mixture of multiple choice and what are known as open response. An open response question means that some general problem is laid out and the more general it is, the more difficult it is to answer in a way. Um, and uh, so that in 1993-94, for instance, we had a reading test with 36 multiple choice and six open response. This year's eighth grade MEA simply became 10 open response questions. That's quite a change. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it, it's just going to be interesting to see what the data looks like and then again how understandable it is to us, what we can do with it. Uh, looking at math, last year's test had 38 multiple choice and 6 open response. This year went to 10 open response. Again, quite a change in format. And so as we look at the results, we will be um, interested to see what we can do. The writing has been open and holistically scored. So that one does not really change, although there may be some aspects of it uh, in the scoring that would change in order to uh, differentiate between the distinguished, et cetera. Um, again, on science, um, I have heard some arguments that two open response under the matrix is not enough to give a real decent sample on that, so I'm sure we're going to hear more about that. But. Um, and again, I, I think this is, is hard for us to know until we see the whole thing and see the range. Uh, it did include a sample, give you a, a sense of what these, what they mean by open response, about building the, uh, the bookcase. Um, I didn't think that one was too bad. I could figure that one out, but I've seen some that, frankly, um, I wouldn't want to be tested on. or. In fact, I saw some in the fourth grade that I wouldn't want to be tested on. Uh, that uh, the fourth grade, the conversation we have about the fourth grade test uh, will be, I think, a little more involved because this change to total open endedness is one thing at the eighth grade or the eleventh grade. Certainly at the eleventh grade, we would hope that the kids could handle a lot of open ended tests. Uh, fourth grade is another story, and we will see there's a lot of conversation going on across the state about that 
right now, and we'll know more about it later. Questions or comments or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Were we aware that this was going to change, or is this a decision that was made? Uh, this decision, I've been trying to figure out exactly where this comes from and what process was used, and I'll have to tell you that it seems to be a little squishy. Uh, maybe I'm being a little, uh, maybe it's just that I don't have the information. Um, of course, the MEAs have been, uh, have a 10-year history. They have a separate division in the um, Department of Education that actually works on the MEAs, although the tests themselves have been developed through Advanced Systems of New Hampshire. Um, it does appear, of course, that decisions have been made on a policy level, presumably through um, the Department of Education. I mean, that seems to be the, the way in which this originally went, from the legislators who set up the uh, statewide test to with some input from the State Board of Education and then to the commissioners, um, to the department, and then some rulemaking originally. Uh, at this point, the rulemaking hasn't been a factor. It's mostly a policy decision. Um, the decision to go to more difficult formats, which would include open-ended, has been a gradual decision and has been coming. The decision to move, as I, we just saw, from a fairly large percentage of uh, multiple choice to all open-ended uh, is a decision, frankly, that the superintendents weren't told about. We, I got a, along with all the other superintendents, got a notice somewhere in, I think it was August. Might have been late July, but my recollection is it was August. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think August is correct. And uh, we have staff, including Nancy and other staff who have been involved with advisory groups from for the MEAs, and I believe we were all somewhat surprised. We knew that there was some conversation going on about this, but the fact that it was going to all happen this year was not a, uh, a process that any of us were involved with, or frankly, anybody that I've been talking to has been involved with. So I'm still trying to get an answer to that one. It's just interesting considering that it, we almost, they almost dropped the MEAs completely due to the budgetary process a couple of years ago. And I mean, this could have some disastrous ramifications. Well, I think it's going to be hard to get the public to understand that we not only have uh, a, you know, the test isn't the test that they think it was. Uh, you know, people kind of got used to comparisons within the state of Maine, right or wrong. I mean, there have been arguments all along about how valid those comparisons are, but at the same time, people kind of thought they knew what that meant. Um, well, now they've changed the rules on us. <laughs> we don't know what it means exactly. We don't even know what it's going to look like exactly. And it's going to be a difficult uh, situation for us to help our parent community understand. Um, I want to bring it up now without knowing all the answers myself so that people are kind of aware. Uh, the superintendents met with some of the people from the State Department. We, we really urged them to do some PR with the papers, you know, get some information out there. What are the purposes behind this? What are they, um, what do they think, hope to gain, and so on? And I don't know, maybe I'm missing it, but I haven't, I haven't seen a whole lot of discussion in the paper about this. I suspect what will happen, like anything else, is that these results will come out and there'll be a whole lot of questions and people's attention will be raised and then I would assume there will be the explanations. So. Any other question or comment? Um, I, well, it, we're kind of talking in a vacuum right yeah. now because mm. we don't have any results. None of us have actually seen the test. We know there's a change in format. Um, I think what will be important is to have, you know, some rational way of going through the results with the people who are most expert in testing in, in the system, the, te you know, the teachers at the particular grade level, and having some way of really looking at what we've got without getting too hysterical about it and trying to glean you know, what's positive out of it and not own something that might not be our problem. But I, I think we'll have to see what we're dealing with to know, to know where we stand. But I do think, I, I think it's, it's important to raise it now because I think uh, you know, people need to know it's it's coming and that we're not nobody's being defensive because we don't know what we're dealing with yet um, but that it is a change um, but we're gonna have to you know find a, a good way to talk to parents and teachers I think about uh, 
about what happens. The dilemma that, that Jim's material raises, how important it is to teach children what the standards are, to involve them in setting those standards, and to recognizing that that is what you are, in fact, uh, moving towards. The dilemma is that when a statewide project wants to sort of generally up the ante uh, as a policy level kind of thing, um, with a situation where it's totally impossible for us to say what kind of uh, open-ended rubrics children are being taught, I mean, how to answer an open-ended question, uh, let alone the content that may be behind the question, because those are two separate things. I mean, you may in fact know, let's say, science or math or have some insight into something, but you may not really know, and certainly this is, gets increasingly true with little ones, how to go about framing that in some way. So um, those are issues that, that I want you to be aware of and that we are certainly, you know, the staff and I've had some conversations about this, but um, I, I think that I agree. I think the point of helping people realize that we are trying to change assessment uh, shouldn't get, get too you know, emotionally charged. Um, but I, I have some concerns about how individual uh, scores and parents will in fact feel about it, or children for that matter, or young people. How are they going to feel about it? So uh, we'll, we'll know more later, and I, that's about all I know at the moment. Do we know when we will get the eighth grade score? Shortly. Shortly. Okay. We first, towards the end of the month, I think that month is February. Okay. <laughs> All right. Shortly after vacation week. Okay. Well, <clears throat> probably it may even crop up on next month's board agenda. All right. Leading us down now, we have for the past, uh, I think it was two months ago, we had a discussion about project adventure requests from our high school phys ed department to. Um, uh, be allowed to go forward with a project that they, in fact, had been doing, but we became concerned because of the um, uh, concerns raised by an insurance company on this project adventure, and we've included some materials um, in our December board meeting. Uh, the, you made a request that there be a presentation of the entire high school curriculum, which is in the packet. We've had a chance to See it, the philosophy, goals, um, description, outcomes for physical education. A physically education, physically educated person is the following attributes and so forth. Uh, stressing cooperation, knowledge, and fitness. And then a list of the individual units that we um, carry forward in our two year freshman and sophomore programs. Um, Scott Shea, uh, Andrew Kerr, the chair of the department, um, and a guest to speak, I think, on Project Adventure are here tonight. So, Andrea, I think you're going to say a few things. Good evening. I was really happy to be here to see the presentation. That was really fun. My name is Andrea Kerr. I'm chairman of the Health Physical Education Department. I'd like to thank Superintendent Goldman and the school board for this opportunity to uh, present Project Adventure. Uh, the way we decided to design this for the evening was to break it into three brief parts. The first one is a brief history of the changes in physical education here at Cape Elizabeth High School and in the nation. Uh, we have a guest, Donna Murray, who will represent Project Adventure, and Scott Shea, who is a physical education um, instructor. My particular challenge activity for the evening was to condense 25 years of experiences in this department at Cape Elizabeth High School into a page and a half. And I did that, so um, I'll start with that. Um, through the years, of the Cape Elizabeth School System has been a leader in physical education programming at the high school level. From a curriculum devoted to team sports in the late 60s to a shift to lifetime activities in the early 70s, we have been driven by a desire to provide an excellent education for our students. With the arrival of the 90s, we continued our curriculum growth with the addition of cooperative and new games. It quickly became apparent that our students were eager for even greater challenges. Over the recent years, our staff has attended workshops and training sessions and subsequently became certified project adventure instructors. 
As a department, we are ready to provide our students with such an adventure-based program. <clears throat> As a curriculum addition, Project Adventure builds upon our problem-solving, leadership-oriented philosophy. Project Adventure activities and challenges provide the perfect environment in which to encourage supervised, healthy, risk-taking, so necessary in the developmental, developmental stages of adolescence, excuse me. Our goal is to develop a, uh, a team concept of support and care as we strive to develop each student's confidence and self-esteem. We are hopeful that after tonight's brief presentation, we will receive the approval necessary to put our Project Adventure program into our menu of learning and experiential activities. The staff is ready, the equipment has been inspected, the students are anxious, and we're ready to go. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Donna Murray, representative from Project Adventure. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm here just to speak briefly about the history of Project Adventure, which is an incorporation down in Hamilton, Massachusetts. And it began back in 1971. Um, a gentleman who was the principal of the Hamilton Wenham High School brought um, an outward bound philosophy and approach into uh, the traditional school setting, which focused on experiential learning. And he brought it into the phys ed program as well as the academic program. And within three years, um, they called that program Project Adventure, which it then began what is now the corporation that's been here for 25 years. They were awarded the National Diffusion Network status, which then allowed schools around the whole nation to adapt through grants from the um, government to bring this into their schools. And as I said, it's, it's not just nationally, but this program is um, spread globally as well. And it's not just in education, but it reaches all the other areas of um, business and human services and things like that. The philosophy or the, the basic foundation of Project Adventure is what's called Challenge by Choice. And it's the belief of Project Adventure that any person or student in this case that's um, involved with any adventure activity has the choice to take whatever challenge or whatever risk that they choose to take. And they can take that with the support of a, a very trust and supportive environment. And that's what you establish as you're doing these activities. When we talk about um, the safety record of a program, there are some key things that need to be focused on. And one of those is um, the training of the staff and making sure that the staff has the foundation of challenge by choice, but also that the staff, Project Adventure has what's called, a mo it's a modality checklist. It looks in it, it's brief, is, it's called GRABS, G-R-A-B-B-S. And as a facilitator of an adventure program, you would want to determine the readiness of your group based on the goal that you're setting for this activity. Is the group ready for it? Um, what's the behavior that the group's showing? So if they're showing what you're looking for, they're ready for the activity. You look at their physical ab abilities, and then you also look at the stage of development that that group is in. And there's four stages that you would, would need to know. And as staff being trained, it's important to have this foundation so that your program has the, the safety record it needs. Um, the other thing that you would need for safety record is maintaining your equipment. And from talking with Scott, um, I think the next step that, that you would look at here for this program would be an accreditation. And Project Adventure does come up and will do that for a program. And there's some specific things that you would need to have here. And one that's already in place is the course inspection. Project Adventure um, recommends that once a year that you have this course inspection of your high elements as well as any low elements that you have. Um, they would come up and they would do a, spend a day or two and observe the classes. Um, they would look at your curriculum. They would look, we, I should say, would look at um, any things that are written, and, and I've seen some that Scott has shown me of, of the curriculum, looking at your goals and, and objectives, and they would also look at your local operating procedures, which would highlight um, 
safety requirements, um, what would happen in emergency if, if need be. They would also review with staff that are trained their knowledge of the ropes course as well. And they would also have a self-evaluation that staff would do that are trained. And um, taking that all into account, then they look at the readiness and, and the safety of the program for an accreditation. Okay. <laughs> Scott? Thank you. Yes? Do you want me to stay up here? Okay, all I'm going to do is try to condense a little bit of the packet of information that you got. Um, just briefly try to explain why I do feel it's important. And as Andrea and Donna have both mentioned, um, the Project Adventure curriculum provides an environment uh, that is different. Uh, than a lot of environments uh, that, that the students are used to as far as other units. Um, this environment, it, it doesn't place any student above any other student, meaning uh, every student is just as important and they all have roles that they play uh, within the challenges and within the progressions as we go through the unit. Um, it's an environment that stresses uh, encouragement, trust, uh, communication uh, and a lot of teamwork um, and so this sets a foundation that hopefully we carry throughout not only the phys ed but into um, years after uh, high school. Um, the environment also uh, is an environment where competition is mim minimized meaning uh, they're used to a very competitive lifestyle as it is uh, and we find that when we take them away from the sports, the team sports and that sort of thing, and they really have to focus on each other um, and solving problems with each other uh, and talking about the critical thinking and so forth uh, with the younger grade levels, this sort of thing develops uh, that as well. Um, and this environment, some of you may have seen just recently actually uh, in the Portland Press, the Outward Bound had a big article in the biz, business section. Um, and they referred to the environment as the learning zone because um, so many organizations are seeing the benefits of this type of program, uh, not just in the educational setting, but with business management and large corporations. Um, we, as phys ed staff, we notice that during this unit um, that takes place this sophomore year, it builds upon their freshman curriculum, which has a strong emphasis on cooperative games and new games. Uh, and the kids develop uh, a sense not only of interaction with each other, but being able to interact with themselves. And I think that's a goal of all physical educators, that we don't just educate them physically, but more of a holistic approach where we educate them uh, mentally, socially, and emotionally. Uh, and we find that it is so easy for the kids to relate all of these things through the Project Adventure curriculum. Uh, I just want to kind of reemphasize uh, what Donna said as far as the guidelines. Uh, we plan on following the guidelines as set by Project Adventure. Uh, and the next step is the accreditation process. And for that step to take place, uh, the program has to be actually functioning so that they could actually come up and observe the uh, interaction between the teachers and students and the whole program in place. Uh, I am currently, I've gone through the advanced skills training uh, through Project Adventure. Uh, I just spoke up at the state conference, and I was one of four speakers up there talking about adventure programming uh, just this fall. Um, the, Guidelines, we also, we plan on having the annual safety inspection and the inspection that we just had um, was a successful inspection. Everything passed, all our, all our equipment was in excellent condition. Uh, and any changes or adjustments that we, that we would want to make to our current curriculum, uh, we'd just make sure that it was passed through Project Venture before implementation. Um, that kind of, sums up 
I think, my feelings uh, at this point. I, I'd just like to kind of open up for any questions you may have for um, myself, Andrea, or Donna. Charlie? Some of us observed a couple of months ago uh, your presentation and, you know, what I found in place as far as, you know, ascending, et cetera, was, you know, all safety precautions. It was a team effort. Um, and some of the earlier building skills of low level did, did promote a, a sense of teamwork and figuring out things as a team as you're going along and sometimes before you even start, but sometimes you have to get involved in a project before you can understand the workings of a project. Sometimes participating and not sitting on the, on the sideline helps you to, to, to be a better um, um, critical thinker. So in that aspect, I found the program to be very safe, and I felt all safeguards were in place. Um, my concern would be, again, the, the insurance aspect, the liability, and if, you know, if, if we get the go-ahead from our insurance carrier that, you know, that we are essentially covered, then I, then I feel it's a very appropriate curriculum. Well, Scott has had conversations, in fact, as recently, I guess, as this afternoon. Um, insurance companies, of course, don't particularly like issues that look different. However, this is not, they're not telling us that, that we can't do it. I mean, that's basically what it amounts to. They clearly are concerned uh, about the checks, and we have, in fact, done the, uh, as people have said tonight, the equipment check. Uh, they're concerned our insurance carrier wants to make sure that people have been suitably trained um, and that there is uh, some visitation that is the accreditation process would be important too. I guess the chicken egg problem is you can't really accredit a program under the way it's being described unless in fact it's it's in place. Uh, I think in my agenda notes I recommended that you if you feel you can go forward with this that uh, I think it is important to understand that that would be um, that this permission is for project adventure in the classic sense. That is the curriculum that is project adventure, not some activity in another unit or another class that is kind of because you're interested in it being transferred and so forth. Uh, in this kind of situation, I think our insurance company would take a very dim view of that and uh, would be something that would exceed the level of risk that I would be comfortable with recommending. Um, I know that the kids will really like this type of thing and I too watch the demonstration and I certainly can understand the, um, the appeal. There's no question about that. And also we do know, and you're correct, the uh, corporate world has been using this as a team builder. Um, unfortunately, I've been around long enough to remember trampolines. <laughs> Um, and what we went through again in the 70s, and of course Andrea's been through these too, that we used to do a lot of gymnastics in schools until our insurance companies felt that they were exceeding the rate of risk that they were willing to, to deal with. And I can't predict that, that rock climb, I mean, we're not doing a climbing wall or a rock, what, what, is, what do you call it? That? Wall. It, you know, there are places you can go to in town to do that. We're not going to replicate that. Um, those issues are troublesome for us, and it's one of the reasons why we've, we felt that we had to go through this process. Um, Scott, is there anything that you need to add from what I've just said about your conversation with the insurance people? When you say increase in premium, do you mean, do you know, a few dollars or thousands of dollars? I don't know what that effect would be. Uh, obviously, you have to look at that. I know that, uh, <coughs> I know that the main municipal would like to come down and take a look at the uh, uh, offerings as well. Hopefully, once we have gone through the accreditation process, they would like to be part of that. Um, but in terms of what the actual dollar figure would be, 
I can't tell you because they uh, uh, currently the municipal does not insure anyone other than Freeport who runs a uh, program that's kind of a takeoff. Okay. Um, they currently don't insure any school departments that run a project of venture activity. There's other insurance companies that do and offer insurance within school departments, but the municipal doesn't have to be one of those. So we would kind of be uh, a leader in that. Oh, can, I, can I just yeah. follow up with Scott on one thing? They won't come down and look at like the demonstration of the program and they, give they some guidelines on the risk? They would be willing to do that. And um, I know that uh, Jeff Dowdy used to come down and take a look at the program itself. Um, it makes recommendations on some various things. And uh, I'm sure they would be willing to come down ahead of time and take a look at that. But, uh, but again, you know, their perception um, is probably based on a lack of education in the program, and I think that would probably be helpful. Well, that may be, but I think we need some guidelines so that we know, <laughs> you know, how much risk we're, yeah. we're undertaking. I mean, I'd, I'm not yeah. adverse to having a little bit of risk if we just know what it is and when we've stepped outside a reasonable risk. And well, I think, I, I think the issue, again, is that we are unsure. There is, there is no doubt that we are unsure. Uh, they do perceive it as having an element of risk to it. Uh, it's not an issue of whether we're insured or not. Charlie? The, the, you know, when I look at this curriculum, which is on the last page, and, and I think of my own curriculum when I was in high school, you know, I see this as more life skill building and things that I would have done much earlier than my life if I'd have been exposed to a lot of these. When I look at the, the project graduate, the project adventure element of this curriculum, and I, and I, and then my perception of, of the accidents that happened before we suspended it were variations on not the, not what we were presented, but variations on kids taking risks outside of the curriculum. And that's where my concern would be, mm -hmm. that we hold to the curriculum and that that students who want to take risks beyond that, it's, it's, it's a no-go. I mean, it's not an option. That and was something that was very stringently emphasized by the municipals that we do adhere to the project adventure curriculum and to the accreditation of that uh, curriculum, and then we don't vary from that. Um, that's where the accidents come from, is that we vary from uh, what those accredited activities are and deviate to something that's a hybrid of that program. Because I can tell you with students having children who are in sports in this community, they're at a lot more risk than what I saw being performed in that, in that exercise. And having gone through a season of basketball injuries, Yeah, the uh, Project Venture actually, and Donna probably, if you're interested in specifics, she might be able to tell you a little bit, but they've done a 10 and 15 year study, um, safety study, and they, they've shown that the statistics are definitely lower with the Project Venture curriculum com as compared to a regular phys ed team sport type curriculum. Um, and it's interesting too, the, the two young students that participated with you that night are students who aren't actively involved in a lot of our, our sports activities too, so, and they were very enthusiastic mm -hmm. about it. Would it be um, clear that I mean, they, they take this during physical education period, right? Yes. So if by any chance the instructor was out sick and there was a sub, they would not They would not be able to, right, correct. This out. Correct. Are, are parents informed of this program? It's, um, various degrees, I believe. And I mean, I think, and, and actually, Andrew and I were talking about that the other day. I think our next step actually would be to go to the parents' forum with mm -hmm. almost the same sort of type information um, so that they would be informed. Well, I think it would be important um, before um, student participated in this sophomore year that parents just be informed right. of the type of activities because yes. it is a little out of the norm of what you expect in a 
high school gymnasium. Oops, so is canoeing. So, I think a lot of, yeah, I think a lot of this stuff, to be honest with you, a lot of this curriculum, I question how much the parents actually yeah. do know about what we do do. And I think this has been given us a good opportunity to maybe inform um, a large number of those people of what we do do in that curriculum. Scott. I've had that privilege as well. And, you know, even though there's an element of risk perceived by the insurance company, if anybody's ever participated in that, um, there's an element of team building there mm. that you don't get in other activities. Uh, if you take a look at the spider was actually in the yeah. project venture, trying to take a group of five people and feed them through certain sides openings um, in a web made out of rope and that kind of problem solving, um, that's part of project adventure. Um, I think the elements of the high um, I think those are fewer and farther between than those lower kind of activities, which are more part of the team building activities. Right. And, uh, you know, my experience is with a group that I work with, and um, I think there's a lot to be gained by it. So, yeah. But I feel it's also my responsibility to pass on to you the, uh, you know, the issues of what our insurance company had. But from a personal, a personal perspective, um, if you've ever experienced it, it is a truly experience. Uh, Rewarding activity. I'd just like to say one other thing. I mentioned to Connie quite a few uh, months ago, actually, about the difference between a perceived risk and a risk. And this Project Venture Outward Bound and so forth, those types of programs are designed around a perceived risk. And there's a difference. Because if it was a risky program, they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't exist as a program and they wouldn't be so successful. Um, and so I think those people that are familiar have actively participated in this sort of thing as far as programs go. They know what the benefits are when there's a perceived risk involved um, in relation to something that is risky. I think people that have not gone through or really are not um, informed about everything that takes place in these sorts of activities um, they only see little pieces, and they say, wow, that looks risky. Um, so I think that there's definitely a distinction that has to be made between something that is risky and something that's perceived to be risky. Do we, do we pay a fee for this, like an ongoing fee or any kind of? The only fees would be in the continual training would be for the uh, safety inspection. Um, which would be an annual safety inspection. When, when you talk about safety inspection, who who exactly? Project Adventure. Project, OK. Sends up, yes. Is there a fee for the certification for the accreditation process, that kind of yeah. thing? It's $375 for um, a safety inspection, and we recommend that it happen once a year. We've already done that. Right. Yes. Right. And but within that time frame of the year, you can then have your done and then someone from Project Adventure down in Massachusetts will come up and spend a day or two and go through everything that we Does that have a cost to it though? Um, I honestly, I can't recall. I, I don't work down there full time and I haven't done those, but. Um, yeah, I think there is between $100 and $200, yeah, I think, additional. Yeah, yeah. yeah somebody's For the two days. Yeah. Done within yeah. the same yeah. time as the safety inspection. Are we voting on this tonight? Are well, I think that they, I mean, this is our second go round, and I, I'm sure that people would like to have some sense of, of, of a practical way in which we can deal with this. I tried to give you some, some sense. Um, the bottom line is our insurance company is not saying to us we cannot do it because they will not cover it. It is covered. They are saying they have discomfort, and they are saying because it's an unfamiliar program with which they have some discomfort, they can't tell us for sure whether there would be an increase in premium or not. In other words, I think we have a chicken egg problem. They've got to come down, mm -hmm. visit it. It's a program they're really not familiar with. They're familiar with some things that have happened um, both here and in other schools that they're familiar with where things that are kind of tagged project adventure but are not really part of that specified curriculum, as you've already mentioned, have resulted in some risky behavior. 
Um, I think that's where the source of their discomfort is. I don't know how we can go any further with this unless we actually allow a unit of participation to go forward so that we can have people come in and accredit the program, get the insurance people in, um, and determine those issues. I mean, I think we may have done all we can do absent going forward with, with the unit. Now, as a board, you can go ahead with that with some caveats, you know, that the low level, you know, minimize the, the, the risk until, uh, and it, well, minimize the risk anyway, but um, uh, <laughs> that, that the, the issue of, of starting a unit and then getting uh, Maine Municipal in to be part of the, of, of the situation, and that, I think that's critical. Um, so that means really basically planning the curriculum or planning those projects with a minimum of any kind of uh, actual rope climbing until you can, you can make that happen. It seems to me that's a reasonable approach, but it's up to you people to make the decision. Carl? I think the, um, the point that Scott made about education is, is well taken. I think if uh, Maine Municipal is at all reasonable, I don't know, that if they actually come in, I was also at the presentation, and it, when it's done correctly, when it's done to the guidelines, it is incredibly safe. Mm -hmm. And I think that if they have the opportunity to see that, I just really feel if they're reasonable, intelligent people, they will see that. Yeah. And therefore, I think this is within the realm of risk that perhaps isn't as risky as it sounds. And, and also, the point about team sports is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Think of hockey, for instance, and people don't blink an eye. So. I think it is the education factor. And I think if it was in place, and if the insurance company, if parents, and if anyone else saw it in person, a lot of that uh, gray area of, of risk fear kind of disappears. Scott, did you have a comment? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was going to relate to, if you actually took a look at the student accident reports that we've had in the past, at least in the past year and a half that I've been here, um, those accidents that are directly related to Project Adventure are pretty minimal. Um, and very minor. Um, we've had one issue, which is a takeoff, but uh, a project adventure. But I think if you if you put the program in place and maintain those in a separate file, and take a look, say after a, a semester of the program, take a look at the accident reports that might relate to that. I think you can get a better feel for what the program is doing. It feels everybody with lots of confidence when you say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we do. The fact of the matter is accidents do occur. They, act, they, they occur on the playground. Um, they occur in the corridors, um, things that are genuine accidents. So, I mean, it is a fact that we have an accident. Well, most of them are small things, but our process is that, that we, we are informed of those kinds of things. Well, I um, think there's an important distinction, though, between something that's, curriculum, that's in the curriculum right. and an accident that happens you know, because someone slips on a sidewalk. Right. But, I, but I, I can tell you, I feel very secure about this program versus some of our sports activities. Yeah. And that's from a parent's perspective. Well, I think, unless anybody has any further they, they have to add, I'd entertain a motion. Yeah. I'll make a motion that we um, approve Project Adventure on a uh, probationary basis. Um, and have it reviewed by the insurance company and proceed with the accreditation process and review it in, um, would this begin, Connie, in? Now. When would it begin? Now. It's a second like, semester. Yeah. Yeah. Second semester, review it at the end of the year. Right. A second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Go ahead. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 rope. I would, <laughs> um, Scott, just be sure you keep in close contact with Scott and so that we can set those visits up and so forth, and um, good luck. Thank you very much for the yeah. materials and, and for coming here tonight. Your enthusiasm is, is obvious, and it <laughs> does help sell it. Thank you. Charlie. I would just like to thank Andrea and Scott for coming forth with what I asked them to do, and that was a curriculum overview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And now we're going to fly through the rest of the Yes. Agenda. Oh, I know. My gosh. Look at this. <laughs> very quickly, construction is moving along. We, we are finding some um, 
need for structural shoring up in the old Pine Cove, the one that is now being demoed, I mean, you know, removing all the inside, uh, that, however, these are things that can be fixed. It's just why one of the reasons you have a contingency and, and it's uh, one of the reasons why we have been wondering what we would find when we get inside the walls. I think I, I would want to mention that a, what seems to be a, a persistent nuisance is the noise that the air exchange makes on the second floor of Pond Cove we've already moved in. Uh, and I mention that because uh, I know that it's, it's um, uh, the engineers have been assuring us that this is a fixable situation. It can, there will be some noise, of course. You don't have a piece of machinery going on and off without making some noise, but that it can be minimized. They haven't succeeded in minimizing it yet, but I want people to know, in case you get a phone call or a concern, that this is an issue that we're being assured is a fixable um, issue, and uh, we will just simply keep working on it. Uh, budget timeline, you have the information in your packet. I don't need to say anything about that. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I assume this schedule, nobody's going to sit here and write it down if, if we read the budget schedule right now, but is it going to be run on cable? I think so. It's my understanding. I'll I check on that. I think that would that. be helpful, and okay. also I'm sure it will be in the courier, but yes. I, it would be nice for people to, uh, mm -hmm. to know in case they'd like to mm -hmm. come yes. visit us. Okay. Mary. Yes. May I have a comment about Jim Curry's presentation? Um, if it's really quick. It's really <laughs> Okay. <laughs> The teachers who were here uh, wanted to apologize to you for not coming forward to speak when Jim gave them the opportunity because the one thing that they said that they'd like to do is thank you as a board for the opportunity with the staff development, development Monday uh, that gave them the opportunity to have that very valuable staff development and they plan to write you a letter and, and uh, express those sentiments. Well, that's very nice. I mean, I don't think there's anything more important that we could do than give the staff a really useful uh, <clears throat> development opportunity. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Uh, the next item is school board subcommittees and reports. First is finance subcommittee. Charlie. We met at 6.30 in the superintendent's office, um, reviewed the appropriations report, the school lunch program, print out the transportation statistics provided by the state, under budget, we looked at the new subsidy printout, which showed a 2.5% increase versus 5% on the previous. Um, reviewed quickly the budget summary, a revised preliminary, and adjourned. All right, moving on to school building committee, Charlie. Uh, the school building committee met on January 26th. Um, some of the topics covered were going out to bid for looking at the telecommunications package. Um, we approved the recommendations of the movable equipment subcommittee for the cafeterium furnishings. Um, we discussed the scope of additional rehab of the A building and the surfacing of other asbestos issues. Um, the movable equipment subcommittee will meet on Thursday of this week concentrating on the media centers. And um, one of the things that came out was at this meeting that as a result of moving into um, Section C or the Lunt building, former Lunt building, that we would not be moving in unless everything was completely done. Um, we learned a lesson. All right, moving on to policy subcommittee, Beth. Uh, the policy subcommittee met on Wednesday, February 1st in Connie's office. Um, we looked at um, a number of policies to do with our health department, and um, those will be coming up under new business and old business. All right, moving on to unfinished business. Policies for second reading, Beth? Uh, the policies for second reading are KGBA, smoking on school property, KK, visitors to schools. Would you like me to form it as a motion? Sure. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the policies KGBA.
BA and KK for a uh, second reading. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I'd just like to make one comment. If we could get the federal site for that law, since we put sites everywhere else, I don't, okay. I don't think that holds it up. But just to add that for the smoking, add that in for the smoking, since we have the other legal references. I, had, I have a comment on, especially the smoking on school property. It's just the enforcement is just so hard. I mean, mm -hmm. you go to activities after school and you see people outside smoking right outside the door. You know, it's 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 an it's an it's a problem and an issue. And, and how do you deal? I mean, you have a policy that. Well, we don't have it. It's nothing's really posted, is it? No, or very clearly? I mean, I, we did I haven't discuss, We looked, discussed that at the policy meeting that you know there was such a problem and what could we do to address it? Um, and you know it was perceived as a real problem. And and what do we do? Do we start flagging down cars <clears> as they're going out and have them ticketed? One, you know, ran But do we have signage? I don't know. That might be, a, we no, that might be an awareness in at least, you know, yeah, having yeah. signage around that says. Yeah. But th this oh. isn't just students. Oh, I know that. Oh, okay. No, no, no. It's, that's why I said after school activities yeah. such as in the evening. I mean, you go to things in the evening and you see people standing outside yeah. very blatantly smoking. But I guess, you know, I don't think people are aware. They're aware that they can't smoke in the building, but they may not be aware that. Well, this is no a smoke, new, you know. I mean, this is new as far as on school grounds for anybody. I mean, it's not just a school. Yeah, it's, school been, it's, it's been around. This, this has been the general perception of the force of this, even, you know, at, uh, at the fields in the fall and so forth, because we've had some discussions administratively about the, uh, you know, what do you do about it? I mean, it's, it's uh, difficult to discipline adult uh, attendees. We can speak to them, of course, but um, well, maybe if we put a sign on the fence, I don't know. I made a note to I myself. Know, <laughs> I know the soccer games, when, before we announced um, the starting line of yeah. to the spectators, yeah. there's no smoking on the premises. And I've had situations, too, it's generally people who are visiting from other schools, and they'll say, you know, there's no smoking on the property, and it's, okay, sorry about that, and, and, and people will, uh, you know, Abide by it, but I think the signage is yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, various areas around the school buildings, mm. you know, on the outside um, areas. Uh, it makes people yeah. aware. So, I mean, yeah. sometimes you get too much of something and people just disregard but it. But I mean, yeah. I think it would. We can use the newsletters too as a reminder once a year. Mm. All right. Is there Anything second? else? No. There yes. was. Yeah. Carl. Carla. Um, all in favor? Okay, moving on to new business, nomination of administrators for 1995-96 school year. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I noted in the agenda notes, uh, statutes now require, um, actually what they require is notification to administrators if they will not be renewed by the 1st of March so that the way in which one takes care of that is to make the annual nomination of, of uh, administrators as part of the February board meeting. Uh, I've listed them for you. Uh, Rick DeFusco, high school principal. Randy Ray, high school assistant principal. Nancy Hutton, middle school principal. Philip Jewett, middle school assistant principal. Nancy St. John Poncove, assistant principal. Keith Weatherby, halftime athletic director. Wayne Dorr, director of special education with a note that he is currently serving as interim principal, but that purposes of uh, this vote, um, technically, you would be um, continuing that relationship as director of special education. And our two community services people, Sue Weatherby, the director, and Janet Hoskin, the assistant director. Uh, I have commented on the, um, in the agenda notes that I, have wor I work with these people very closely. I have enormous respect for their integrity, their energy, their dedication. Um, I think that becoming, um, being a building administrator now is, is, has become much harder than people realize. Um, it is incredible the kind of relationship skills you have to have to say nothing of problem solving skills. And at least for most of our administrators, uh, and to some degree also at the high school, you have to have literally plumbing, electrician, 
various other kinds of hands-on practical skills um, and patience so that I uh, am very pleased to nominate them. Entertain a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion that we accept the superintendent's recommendations of administrators for the 95-96 school year. Second. Gail's a second. Any discussion? Charlie? As we go out to search for a new elementary principal, you'll find the quality we have here in, in, in that process. That's very true. Very true. All in favor? 7-0. Okay, the next item is Committee for Pond Cove Principal Search, speaking as such. Right. Also in my agenda notes, I made some comments about the process itself, and uh, the first step in that process is to pull together a committee, um, and I gave some sense of what my recommendations would be. Um, did I list them? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, usual practice with two school board members, two building administrators, three or four teachers, um, at least a parent representative in a school that size, you may want to make that two parent representatives and the superintendent. Um, sometimes, of course, with the high school, we include um, student. Uh, I also know in our last search committee, uh, kind of after the fact, we had some discussion about support staff being represented. I would make that would remind you that that is a, uh, an important part of the staff, and I think a representation would be good. Um, it, it makes a, you know, we, we can wind up with a fairly large group, but um, we do need that, that broad base because this group will be conducting the interviews, um, and we do need to have, um, you know, rather than two or three groups, which I never think works well with you. If, been through that kind of process that is not satisfactory. So, what is your pleasure? Um, well, we're going to appoint Keith Witherell and Beth Courier as the school board representatives. Um, so, I assume you'll follow some process through Pond Cove to find the teachers and the support yes. staff. Yes, and the administrators. And, and, mm -hmm. Right, and um, parents. the parent. The plan for the parents is to yes, somehow I, ad advertise for applicants to the committee. Um, I will get something into the courier by uh, next Wednesday, I believe is the deadline. A um, little notice asking for people who are interested to apply to the superintendent's office. And um, I should emphasize that there we will also note that there is a considerable time commitment so that it's a realistic um, request so that people know what they're volunteering for. Since people don't always read um, the newspaper cover to cover, if some if something's going home through Pond Cove to the parents anytime in the near future that to tack a notice on, I think that would be helpful also because I think um, people sometimes miss those little blurbs in the paper. Okay, we will try to reach out. Okay. All right. Moving on to personnel requests. In your package, you have a resignation, a teacher who has uh, been with us very, frankly, very briefly, but she, uh, Melissa Parks, um, is leaving us to take a position in another system. Um, perhaps you want to deal with these separately. I think, I think so. you probably do. I'd entertain a motion. I'll do one. Carla. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go. I move that we accept the uh, resignation of Melissa Myers Parks, um, as written in her letter January 30, 1995. Is there a second? I second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Second um, personnel issue uh, request for half time. Um, status at the kindergartner at the kindergarten from Ingrid Stressinger. Um, these are requests when they come in. Um, most of them do come in, as a matter of fact, at the kindergarten level because of the nature of that um, assignment. And they are year to year requests. Um, and she is asking you to um, basically continue her half time leave status. Charlie? Is this something that has to be acted on this evening? 
I have concern about budgetary and class size and the number of kindergarten. Getting every higher every day. It's uh, what, 137 it, right now? We go through this discussion every year about these type of half-time positions and mm -hmm. we get ourselves into a mess when it gets into budgetary. Yes. Yeah, well, you don't have, the answer to your question is no, you don't have to act on it tonight. Be the, she had an obligation to put this request in by February 1st because we are, are urging any staff that has any unusual or in this case, continuing request to let us know for budgetary purposes. If you want to table it uh, for a month, you can certainly do that. We still wouldn't have got into the budgetary process. So that mm -hmm. doesn't... Well, you want to table it to when? April? April. When? I, I would concur on that. Okay. Yeah, do you have to make that a problem? motion to table? Do we have to make it a motion to table it? I think so. Yes. Actually, I believe any any member of the board can ask to have it tabled. And that's it? That's it. Okay. Table. We want an action. April. Put it for. I move that we table us oh, yeah, until the April better. meeting. Second. I don't, I don't have my, <laughs> I don't have my rules with me. And just to be yeah, on the safe side, any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Um, okay, the next request is actually like a Caesar uh, out of order. The next one in my packet is the leave of absence. I'll put I'll follow the agenda. The next one is the request for sabbatical leave for ninety five ninety six. This is Kelly Hassan. First grade teacher at Pond Cove, um, an outstanding first grade teacher who has applied for a master's program in literacy or in, in actually reading. Um, her paper that I included gives you a sense of what she has in mind. Um, we met with her as, he, as uh, our contract requires for sabbatical groups. She's very clear, very dedicated with what she wants to do. Uh, frankly, I certainly recommend that we grant this. I think it would be not only good for, for Kelly's individual growth, but she would bring back um, additional insights. And um, she's a fine teacher as it is, but I think what she would bring, be bringing back would be very helpful for the program and for the building. And Carla? I was going to make a motion. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we approve the request for sabbatical for Kelly Hassan for the 1995-96 school year. I second it. Any discussion, Charlie? I did ask what if, whatever budgetary impact because mm -hmm. we are in a very tight budgetary. She is one of our one of our. She was a level five teacher, so even at halftime and bringing in somebody to re, to replace her for next year is not too much of an impact on our budget. So. That's correct. I also have to add that I read this proposal and was so excited by <laughs> the course that she was going to take. I, I think it'll be wonderful for everyone. Well, I, I'd just like to say, um, you know, I have worked with Kelly on these language arts committees all the way through, right from the hard days when we were, you know, dealing with the whole language issue. And um, she has always handled herself with great grace and great willingness to to listen and to learn, and I think this request just shows that she's mm. interested in, um, you know, helping both herself, her kids, and um, the school system. So I applaud her for that. It's going to be a lot of work, but I think we'll all benefit. From it. So that's great. Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Good. And the <coughs> last request we have here is for an unpaid leave of absence. This is from Rachel Garrett. Um, Rachel is, is a dandy teacher. <laughs> she really is. And I've been in a few science meetings with her lately, and um, for a relatively inexperienced teacher, she has, uh, she has a lot of promise. I'm not sure, as she says, her long, she's being very upfront with you about a long-range goal, but the, I would recommend the, that you grant this, uh, this leave. She's very clear that she does want to come back, at least for another year. Um, possibly two, but whatever time she spends with us is valuable. 
She is um, a natural teacher and has already contributed a great deal to the, her classes, so um, I'm very comfortable in, in recommending it. I know that we always have, we haven't had a absolutely unblemished record of people who have asked for <laughs> leaves of absence and so forth, but um, this is uh, one time when I can very sincerely say to you, I'd like to help. Well, I move that Rachel Grant, uh, Garrett be given the one year leave of absence. And I'll second that, and I don't usually like to second these mm -hmm. after our, our track record. But <laughs> having had a child who had her the first year she taught in the system, as an inexperienced teacher, she really was a good role model. We talk about role models for girls and getting girls interested in science. And I think the courses she's going to take will strengthen, we're talking about strengthening our science curriculum. It will truly strengthen the science curriculum in the middle school. So I strongly support this. Um, I would just ask, don't, is, is it a contractual um, issue about, doesn't, don't we ask that they commit to come back for one year? She certainly she, is. She is willing she to. She is very willing to, to commit do that. to that because we've had that problem before. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is great, but, you know, if she decides at the end of the year that she's not coming back, mm -hmm. then um, well, that's hard. That's hard for us. But if she's committed. She is committed. Okay. She does understand that she's the kind of person you can very easily have that kind of conversation with. Um, so it certainly is her plan. Obviously, nobody necessarily knows all the circumstances of their lives <laughs> a year in advance, but. Um, for all predictable issues, uh, she is coming back. Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Okay, moving on to policies first reading. Yeah. Uh, the policies for the first reading tonight are all the policies brought to us by the nurses. Um, a lot of them had to be totally redone. Some are completely new, ones we didn't have in our book, and some are just minor changes. Um, I guess the, the easiest way is just to ask people to ask questions on any that they have, and then I can put it in a motion form. Um, it's just first reading. Just so. first reading, OK. Um, why don't we just go through them one by one, if people have. OK, questions. first aid was completely redone. Um, you can see the old one behind. Anybody have a comment? I only, I only had one question on number two, you know, under the, uh, at the end of the first page, in the event of the mm -hmm. injury, what will be done. Um, I was a little surprised that when it says, if, if dangerous and needing medical attention within 20 to 30 minutes, allergic reactions, laceration, fracture, parents will be called. I'm surprised it doesn't have something about you know, the discretion of calling rescue at that point. You know what I'm saying? I think it would probably, if they can't get a hold of parents, it'd probably go up into, uh, one, you're needing medical attention, you know, as you got to the end of the 30 minutes or whatever. I would be more comfortable if it was just spelled out. Wouldn't so if, if so parents cannot be reached are. immediately, right. then rescue would be called? Right. Or, or whatever. I'm not saying that's, that's the action that should be taken, but... So basically you're saying more detail? Yeah, and the, and the same on the back where it says rescue will be called under the following circumstances. I, I would think that they would want a little more discretion than, than, no, than just those particular items. Seems like it should say rescue under the following specific cir circumstances and then or at the discretion of the school or whatever it should be. Well, it says, mm -hmm. at, you know, at number one, is, it, is that what you're referring to, sorry? Well, it says determination shall be made by the school nurse principal or designee as to the severity of the emergency. So, I mean, there is a, a sense that somebody has to make that decision. And then it tries to, uh, I, I know from listening to them, that they were trying to categorize a way by which, you know, they have a protocol. Uh, if that's not clear, I guess we have to go back to them and ask them for some. I mean, they saw this as kind of a ladder 
Right, I know, but I mean, there are, if you've got a dangerous situation and you just say you're going to call the parent, I mean, that's not always going to be the end result. I think it should just be mean. clear okay. All right, thank that you. that may not be the end of the line. And same with the back, you know, it says we'll call under these circumstances. I'm sure there are other circumstances. I don't know what they are. I don't see why they should list them all, but that it should be at their discretion, uh, up to their judgment. I will, se I will send them back for a little more detail there. The um, next one was the policy for physical examination. Um, that is a new policy. We didn't have one in our book. It was a suggested one. Um, there were some changes made from this, or I think more some eliminations made from the suggested policy to come up with this one. Uh, number three, I think it's just a type of typographical error. Must provide a completed from. I think it's form. Oh yeah, yeah. must be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Could we also say in number two, enterers is not a word. Can we say new enrollees? <laughs> enterers. Yeah, we, we can. We can do that and, <laughs> and just two more little nitpicky things. They don't need the, um, the physical exam form for kids coming into kindergarten until 90 days after? Well, actually, I guess they never, they in never reality, have, have to, have, to have one. OK. They, they just to try to get it. Yeah. All right. And under four, where it says the sports candidates questionnaire, it says 8th, 9th, 11th, and 12th grades. Was 10th grade just left out? That I don't know. Well, 10th grade is required to have a physical up above. Oh, okay. So this is mm -hmm. just, I see. Well, not having had a kid at that level. I <laughs> oh, used to be different. Okay. Where we have sixth graders involved in um, track, and I don't know what other sports, what other sports are sixth graders involved in other than track? Um, only, the, only the cross country. Yeah. So we may need to add six. For the sports one? Yes. You mean number four? Yeah. So they do participate. Yep, you're right. Yep. The next one is um, immunization of students. Um, that was a policy before. And if you look the next page over, there are some changes. Um, basically, well, they're not too many changes, but the A has sort of disappeared. And um, that we don't, they basically have to uh, present the, the forms or a reason why they are not immunized. Anybody have anything on this one? No? Communicable diseases is a new policy. We didn't have one. Um, again, most of it was taken from suggested language. I just had one question on the uh, second paragraph where it says, all children with a notifiable communicable disease shall be excluded from school. I, I, I assume they mean notifiable to the department. Yeah, I actually we we talked about that, and they have a list that they get from the main whatever health thing is that tells them what the notifiable diseases are of that. You know, I guess it changes. Right, but it, um, as far as I remember from having very young children, kids are often excluded for non-notifiable things. I assume things like when they send your kids home with lice and things like that are not notifiable, but. Yes. I think um, it might be, actually. Is it notifiable? Mm. Really? You have yeah. to report that? OK. Yeah. Yeah. But well, I think not every we, we discussed. Case, not everyone. Um, it's, no, we yeah, have a massive a, epidemic. And we discussed strep as it's not a notifiable one, right. but if we certainly get a lot of cases of it, it becomes a notifiable one. Yeah, I know when you th when you read that thing about communicable disease and you walk into the schools at this time of year, you think there shouldn't yeah. be anybody there, you know? That's true. 
Well, again, I guess my point is that there's a certain amount of discretion involved here. They have a very um, good manual, and I can't remember exactly what it was called, but then they all refer yeah. most of this back to, and it has very exact guidelines of what they do. Um, do we want to note that? Yeah, I can't remember what it was called. <laughs> no, but have them write it either with an asterisk or something that they would refer as referred to or from. That, well, all of these would be then referred to that book, oh. that they're all, um, you know, all of them refer back to that, even the first aid. I think there should be some, note of, some notation in here of who's providing the list or, or mm -hmm. right. whether it's a state agency or what. So it makes it clear cut that it's, because mm -hmm. that's not the way I would have read, read that statement. Notifiable would be recognizing it and sending the kid home. But no, yeah, it's, 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 it's not quite clear. clear in terms of also their discretion. Um. Notifiable has definitely to do with the state health. I think whatever. it has to be so stated. It's a technical term, perhaps as defined by the yearly update, whatever that report thing is called. or whatever. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and the last one is administering medicines to students. Um, that is a new policy. There were some forms attached to this, of the form the parent fills out and et cetera. Um, but this would actually be the policy. It was taken from suggested language um, with some changes, but very minor. To be honest, it seems to me that the only thing that is a policy issue is the first paragraph, and the rest of it is really an administrative guideline. But that may be. Hmm, that's an interesting point. Although, since there, it would be hard to separate out some of these things. Uh, what we have had is very little language in the board policy manual, and they have had a, a building manual themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, this does bring it a little more into the um, into the policy mainstream, where you are aware of these issues, and they still have far more guidelines to follow mm -hmm. than what is in here. So I, I think you have a pretty good balance for that. I see your point, but. I, I think it is, we're being recommended by our attorneys to have some language about this in. Oh, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't quib quibble with that, but it just seems to me like the first paragraph is the policy and the rest of it is an Pretty administrative much. guideline that's, we have many of them in our book mm -hmm. um, that we could have in our book, but. Probably not the second paragraph because from my daycare licensing, it's a licensing regulation that medicine comes in in the original container. It's set down by the state, so it's probably set oh, really? down by the state yeah. for us, too. All right. I, think that they're too I know that they're recommending you to do that. Oh, sorry. The AIDS policy, um, HIV attendance policy, um, is to be uh, reviewed and accepted. There were, um, if you look at your white copy, we changed the words um, on the second page in B no, sorry, G, to the Cape Elizabeth School Department, and I think it said the school board there last time. And um, then on the last page, we deleted the paragraph, the second from the bottom, that had talked about the fluoride mouth rinse program, since we don't do it, we never, or do not plan to do it again in the future. Um, so that was deleted. Can I just pass my copy down to you because with the typos and things? Yeah. <laughs> we did discuss there were a lot of typos. I think actually this was retyped in the school building. Oh, it and was? Okay. And Connie Brown was going to get it on she her computer okay. and she didn't get to it because this was my copy that. So that was the. 
Okay. I just have an administrative question back on first aid. It had to do with latex gloves and band aids being available in each classroom. That is true. We are, talked. Are about those la latex gloves? Accessible, or are they going to be in some closet where you can't? No, cover? apparently we talked about. Are they going to be on the wall or? They're in very the accessible. They're drawers. right in the drawers. Okay. And that even the playground aide is supposed to wear a, a hip belt with latex gloves and band aids and things in it, so that if okay. an accident happens right away on the playground, that the the stuff is right there. Okay. And it it does happen. Is that right? Yeah. All right, moving on to nominations for athletic B coaching positions for 1994 95. Shouldn't that be? Uh, 95. Well, it's a year down, 94. Yeah. Anyway, we have one, uh, a shared position, half each, seventh and eighth grade B boys basketball. Sort of sounds like some kind of cheer. Uh, shared position, one half each, Evan Rose and Kevin Sears. That's it. Entertain a motion. I so move that the athletic fee positions for seventh and eighth grade B boys basketball team, uh, yeah, team, uh, share position half time each, Evan Rose and Kevin Sears. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I do have a question. Okay. From our middle school representatives, basketball is almost over. Oh, it's certainly well underway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had quite a number. But I believe yeah. our, it had just started um, at our January meeting. Okay. We did not have yeah, I know. It's just interesting these mm -hmm. positions, but there's such participation that you have to create a B team. Yeah. All in favor? Seven zero. All right. I can entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations with the teachers association and the administrative unit. So moved. So second. So second. second. All in favor. <laughs> Seven zero. Okay. 